dangerous. This talk is being recorded and will be posted online on the website, thehiddenpearl.org. We thank our guest speaker, Susan Ashbrook Harvey, for her paper entitled Creation, Order, Beauty, Jacob of Sarug on Liturgical Aesthetics. We extend our gratitude to Sebastian Brock for presenting our guest speaker and His Excellency Elias Zaidan for sponsoring this online conference. Before we start, I would like to share with you the logistics of managing this talk. You may direct your questions to today's speaker only at the end of her presentation. To do so, click on the reactions icon under the video feed. When the small pop-up window opens, click on raise hand. I will call on you in the order I see uh, on the order I see you on my screen, and I will request that you unmute yourself. Once unmuted, you may ask your question. We would like to congratulate Michael Philippen on his forthcoming book, Invitation to See a Christianity in Anthology, uh, in Anthology, which should appear in February of next year. We have asked him to present his book to us. Thank you, Michael, for being with us. The mic is yours. Thank you so much. Let me start by sharing a screen before I share a little bit about a book. So a few years ago, the University of California Press approached me and asked me to lead a team to make an English language anthology of Syriac literature. And along with the other editors, many of whom you know, Scott Fitzgerald Johnson, Tina Shepherdson, Charlie Stang, we produced about a 430 page volume um, that will be coming out this February. While we thought this could be of use to specialists in Syriac studies, because it's always nice to have some easily accessible text that may be outside your own research specialty, really our target audience for this work was twofold. First, for those who are members of the Syriac church to have an easy accessible volume to help appreciate the richness and breadth of the tradition that they're a part of, and also for those who teach or who are students, we felt this volume could be useful at a number of different levels. At the graduate level, we could see it being used for students' uh, qualifying exams or for a graduate seminar in Syriac Christianity. But perhaps for us, the most important level is also at the undergraduate level. That is that if someone is teaching a survey course and something like the Global Middle Ages or Introduction to Christianity or Church History, and now they could easily incorporate Syriac sources within their syllabus. In other words, similar to the project that James Walter shared with you the other month, we're trying to make sure no one has any excuse to still teach Christianity solely from a Western perspective. Now, the book itself is concentrated on various texts. We have about 130 texts and textual excerpts that take up about three quarters of the book, 150,000 words. We've organized those um, by theme so that it could be more easily incorporated into previous frameworks of knowledge or into pre-existing syllabi. In addition to the actual text themselves, we've included another number of aids to help in their teaching and learning. This includes very brief chapter introductions um, for the theme of that chapter. Every text has a very brief textual introduction as they go from the second to the 14th centuries. We also have been able to include about 15 or so pictures of Syriac artifacts and architecture. In addition to being fully indexed, it also includes beautiful maps that you may already be familiar with um, from 
David Mitchelson and in the Syriac world. We also have a list of where readers can go further to see more of the text, either in translation or the original, a appendix on named authors, and finally, a short glossary. The book itself is going to be available on the auspicious date of 2 2 22 And we're particularly pleased that University of California Press is able to release it in soft cover and for just under $40. So my hope is this may find a happy home in some of your bookcases, and most importantly, may be a resource that you're able to use in your teaching or you're able to point others towards. So again, thank you for the few minutes to give you a foreshadow of what's coming up in February. And now let me pass the virtual mic uh, to Sebastian Rock. Thank you very much, Mike. This sounds a wonderful project. I look forward to seeing its appearance. Well, <clears throat> it's a very particular pleasure and joy to introduce Susan Harvey, who's been Professor of Religious Studies at Brown University since 1987, I think. She is a very distinguished scholar of early Christianity and ha has worked especially in the field of women's studies uh, and early Syriac writers. Her books are known to most of you probably. She started off with a wonderful uh, work based on her thesis, Asceticism and Society in Crisis, John of Ephesus and the Lives of the Eastern Saints. And remarkably, this came out in 1990, 30 years later, it's still the only monograph, I think, on John of Ephesus, um, wonderful collection of lives. I had the great pleasure and honor to collaborate with her on a collection of lives of women saints from the Syriac Orient, which came out as Holy Women of the Syriac Orient in 1987. Um, one of her most attractive works, I think, uh, <clears throat> and fairly short but very profound, is her lovely Marquette lecture, Song and Memory, Biblical Women in the Syriac Tradition, where much of her research work has been concentrated in a wonderful way. Her magnum opus is, of course, the seminal study on the spiritual sense of smell, scenting salvation, ancient Christianity, and the olfactory imagination, a really pioneering work that came out in 2006. She's also been the editor of, of this very useful Oxford handbook of early Christian studies, which I consult quite frequently. It has a lot of very good essays. Some of these handbooks are rather disappointing, but this one is definitely not. Well, she has worked especially on, as I say, on the role of women, but also of women's choirs. And she herself is a Mazamro Nitho. Uh, she's an, <clears throat> a chantress, and so she's not going to chant her lecture. I would I'd like, I'd like to invite her to give her talk, Creation, Order, and Beauty, Jacob Serug on liturgical aesthetics. So over to you, Susan. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for your kind words and my gratitude also to Your Excellency Bishop Z Elias for sponsoring this splendid series. I offer further thanks to our steadfast organizers, Armando El Khoury and Robert Kitchen, whose labors have been heavy, but the yield abundant. And to all of you, Your Excellencies, teachers, colleagues, and friends, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you for making this series a truly a feast throughout this full year. Each month, a new and inspiring exploration of Mar Jacob's extraordinary work and career. It is an honor to be presenting today and also daunting. What a year we have had. Sebastian Brock began us last January with presentation of the many reasons why we should celebrate and study the work of Mar Jacob. 
Attention to those reasons has followed richly in the papers we have heard since then. Scholarship to set Jacob vividly within the tumultuous ferment of his times in the late 5th and early 6th centuries. Explorations into his intellectual inheritance, his artistic culture, and his theological context always with a view to the work he performed tirelessly in his ministries and through his craft as poet and preacher. We have seen Jacob as teacher, exegete, moral instructor, spiritual counselor, as shepherd of flocks, as leader amongst leaders, as pastor and mystic. And each time the eloquence of his poetry, illuminated by the careful scholarship of our colleagues, has rewarded us. I hope my brief remarks today will also contribute something, however small, to this richly multifaceted portrait of Mar Jacob we have brought together. Today I turn our thoughts to what I have come to think of as Jacob's home, the liturgy. I will first talk about the liturgy as Jacob described it across various Mimre, and I will attempt to highlight its aesthetic attributes, at least according to Jacob. I will then turn to his discussions of creation, primarily in his homily 71 on the six days of creation, but also in others, to ask how we might understand the typology and therefore the power and meaning of Jacob's aesthetics. I hope to allow fresh insight into liturgy as a performed practice of the ancient church. And I should say, especially to this group, uh, I will be citing from a number of Jacob's homilies and all of them will be from the uh, Bedian collection, Bedian and Brock collections. Um, we've had wonderful contributions over this past year from the extraordinary new collection brought for us by Morseverios, Acras but I haven't yet uh, extended this work there. I should clarify further about my discussion today. As will quickly become apparent, when Jacob speaks of liturgy, he speaks of singing. Indeed, he speaks in song. Using terms for singing and song interchangeably with terms for words or speech or voice. Jacob's attention to song is frankly lavish. Elsewhere, I have written on the fundamental place of music in ancient Syriac liturgy. No treatise on music survives to us in Syriac until Anton of Takrit in the 9th century and then Bar Ibroyo in the 14th. In late antiquity, for Ephraim, Jacob of Sarug, Narsai of Nisibus, and others, Music in the liturgy seemed to serve primarily a functional purpose. It was an effective and useful pedagogical tool. Jeffrey Wicks has helped us to understand that for teaching and learning. Further, it was an effective and useful therapy for one's disposition, whether personal or collective. It yielded peacefulness of heart within the self, as Jacob wrote, and harmony within a congregation or community. Music provided order when there was disorder. But it seems to me that Jacob of Sarug is truly singular amongst ancient Syriac authors for the attention he gives to singing as an aesthetic expression. He has a theological view of it, and it is that theology of song that I am after today. So I begin with Jacob's liturgy. Across numerous homilies, Jacob of Sarug presents glimpses of Syriac liturgy as performed during his era. These glimpses include detailed descriptions, stray comments, specific or metaphorical allusions, complaints, and remonstrance regarding improper behavior. Those are always the most fun. Glowing accolades for pious participation and rapturous praise for full liturgical celebration that included the entire worshiping community. Clearly, Jacob was concerned that liturgy should be performed fittingly, even skillfully. In his homily on the partaking of the holy mysteries, 
he enumerates the constituent parts of the liturgy, their ideal qualities, and the appropriate contribution of each participant. This is an invaluable text, for it is not a manual of rubrics for the clergy, but rather a guided tour for the congregation and for us. Thus Jacob instructs, this is my favorite part, everyone should arrive on time, prepared to be focused, attentive, and wholly present in body and mind. In stately order, matters should proceed. And I will quote phrases of Jacob as I summarize here. The glorious voices of the women's choir will pour forth the psalms and holy hymns. The lections from the Old and New Testaments are pipes of gold, offering rivers, magnificent streams, bringing water of life without end. Scripture and its exposition in the sermon offer teaching, education, medicine for every wound, and illumination of the heart. Peaceful disposition and joy of being grow as the sounds of holy hymns enter deep into the soul. Hearing is crucial to liturgical participation. Hearing as an active practice of reception of the words which, as Jacob chants, are presented in liturgy always as an offering of song. As the liturgy continues towards the Eucharist, hearing must turn to singing. Each participant must give voice. Jacob exhorts that each voice must be loud with careful intention, intoning the Lord's Prayer, calling out their petitions, singing forth with the priest the supplication of the epiclesis, joining the crowd for the sanctus, annoying Satan, and battling him away by the fervently sung, shouted cry for forgiveness. As the participant sings out and Jacob urges, elevate your voice, the priest brings forth the Eucharist. The faithful should rush to go in and beg for forgiveness with a loud voice. Jacob presents a penitential prayer a hymn that would come to be inserted into the Eucharistic liturgies of the Syriac Orthodox, Maronite, and Catholic churches. The liturgy, then, should draw to a close as it began. One should be present, pay heed, listen, receive, offer voice, and depart, nourished and in peace. In other homilies, Jacob sometimes pauses to marvel at what the event of liturgy displays. He does this for both large and small scales. In his festal homily for Palm Sunday, the Sunday of Hosannas, for example, at the large scale, Jacob brings his mimro for the feast to a resounding conclusion with a description of liturgy. Led by the singing of children, the whole of creation sings its praise, stones, woods, diverse creatures, rational and mute beings in their own various ways, sun, moon, and firmament, land, seas, high mountains, floods, forests, trees. I quote, heaven and earth are filled with his glory, and whatsoever is created whispers praise to its creator. All his creations with their tongues sing the glory. And not all, only, not only all creation, Jacob continues, but all people, the young, the aged, the shepherds, the assemblies. Behold, all voices from all mouths are singing your praise, O Lord, with all tongues, since you have stirred them up for your praise. More, Jacob adds, more. The cherubim, the seraphim, the heavenly ranks, and all the church. All are giving thanks to you because by your coming, everything is renewed. You are blessed by all. To you be praise from all tongues." End quote. And so the gathered church, with the whole of the natural cosmos above and be below providing its setting. Small scale, Jacob offers occasional glimpse of how an individual should pray whether as part of the assembly or alone at home or perhaps in a monastic cell. 
in his homily on the Lord's and always exquisite prayers of invocation, calling on Christ, from whom all words abound, to grant Jacob words, quote, that I might sing pure praise to you. After a long exposition on prayer as the means by which the believer does battle with Satan, Jacob turns to the Lord's Prayer. As in his homily on the partaking, he stresses the importance of proper preparation of the self. In order to pray the phrase, thy kingdom come, one must prepare the self, Jacob says, sings, as a house pure and completely filled with holiness, with its door completely fashioned and adorned. Indeed, Jacob sings here of the self as a microcosm of the church building. I quote, inside the house, which is the heart, you must sprinkle purity, all the thoughts which love beautiful things every day. In the soul, which is the court of the house of the king to come, you must incense sweet fragrances, good works on all sides. On the floor of the house, set a rug of pure love, clear out the putrid stench of vices, and let your soul become a place worthy of the king's encampment. Elsewhere in Jacob's first festal homily on the nativity, he had described the same kind of individual and even private actions as the Virgin Mary prepared herself to receive the conception of the incarnation in her womb. It's a wonderful passage a moment of time inserted into the gospel account, not there. So like a housewife preparing her home for a royal visitor, or I think like a priest preparing the church building on Sunday morning, Mary cleaned and mended and freshened her inner self, swept out the old refuse of vices, adorned her soul with sweet sense of virtues, and throughout her preparations, she sang hymns of praise and thanksgiving. Preparation of the self meant preparation of one's body and soul, just as the church building must be prepared for the worshiping assembly. In Jacob's homilies, actions of preparation for worship, for liturgy, are actions of beautification, cleaning, mending, healing, freshening, adorning, clearing out vices, adorning with virtues, ornamenting always with songs of prayer and praise. In the instance of the Virgin Mary alone in her chamber, or the layperson preparing to pray the Lord's Prayer, or the worshiper preparing to attend liturgy instead of to go to the marketplace, Jacob presents those actions analogously to the preparation of the church building for the gathered assembly. Late antiquity was an era when, Christian, when the Christian art of liturgy flourished. Sumptuous hymnography, trained choirs and chanters, glorious clerical vestments, elegant buildings ornamented with splendid textiles, frescoes, mosaics, liturgical instruments, lavish fragrances of incense, perfumed holy oils, and scented candles, elaborately choreographed processions, exquisitely produced lectionary manuscripts. All these artistic forms of expression served the purpose of contributing to liturgy as a ritualized offering, fitting and worthy of the deity whom it served. In Jacob of Sarug's homilies, notably, this lushness of ritual beauty is characterized most often and most extensively through his references to song, to music, words, singing, voices, and sung prayers, rather than to any of these other artistic expressions. What was the aesthetic that guided Jacob's cultivation of liturgical expression? whether his own or that of his attending liturgical agents, whether deacons or choirs or that of his congregations. 
In his magisterial homily 71 on the six days of creation, Jacob tied close examination of the Genesis creation accounts, Genesis 1 and 2, together with extensive liturgical references and terminology. Moreover, he brought these two thematic streams, creation and liturgy, to a culminating celebration of beauty in his treatment of God's rest on the seventh day. Elsewhere, beauty for Jacob was often a moral category. The Virgin Mary's free will was the measure of her beauty. For the Incarnation, the widowed Tamar's deceit of her father-in-law Judah in Genesis 38 was an act ugly in its plain doing, but beautiful in its intention and meaning. What, in Jacob's view, made liturgy beautiful? What measure of aesthetics did he bring to liturgical performance and participation, such that it might befit village, monastery, or city with or without material wealth to adorn its presentation? How did Jacob's theology of creation inform his liturgical aesthetics? So we turn to Jacob's homily on the six days of creation. Jacob's homily on the hexameron is an extraordinary poetic feat. At 3,020 lines, 151 pages of Bedyan's edition, it is one of his longest. The first hexameron in Syriac Jacob's Mimro drew deeply on Ephraim's commentary on Genesis for guidance. Jacob himself, like Narsai and other Syriac poets of his time, treated the creation story additionally in other works, and in some respects, his hexameron echoes themes that were clearly in vogue in the theological discourse of his time. Commentaries on Genesis and its creation accounts had already built a rich tradition in Greek and Latin as well as Syriac by Jacob's time. In the fourth century, Basil of Caesarea's magnificent homilies on the Hexameron had opened what would become a veritable genre of Christian literature in all these language traditions. Basil's Hexameron had been translated into Syriac by Jacob's day and there is some evidence, especially in Jacob's presentation of the fifth day of creation, that he may have known Basil's text. As the first major extensive hexameral treatments in Christian tradition, Basil and Jacob are interesting to compare. Of course, time constrains us, and so I have time here only to note some important differences in both form and content. First, Basil's Hexameron was presented as a series of nine homilies preached over five days at more than 3,000 lines. We might wonder if Jacob's might have been preached over more days than one. But Basil's was preached over five days in Lent, perhaps in the 370s. Famously, these homilies, in fact, treat only the first five days of creation. In prose, albeit artistic prose, Basil was determined to preach in terms accessible to his audience of workers and craftspeople. While repeatedly calling his audience to wonder and marvel at the glory of the created world, a theme often extolled by ancient Christian writers, Basil also sought to be plain spoken. He was happy to wax lyrical, but he had no interest in allegory here. I quote, when I hear grass, I think of grass, and I do the same with plant, fish, wild animal, and ox. I take everything just as it is said, end quote, and perhaps here in contrast to Origen and his allegorical methods. Rather, Basil gives an interesting intersection between the scriptural verses and the science of his day, drawing on the philosophical traditions of natural history, both botany and all the forms of sea, bird, and animal life, delighting in listing taxonomies of each along with their useful moral lessons. Every plant, every species has a purpose, he insists. For example, he admonishes that the majority of fish eat one another. 
But we ought not to imitate this with our oppression of the poor by the rich. On the other hand, Basil points out, we would do well to emulate storks in the solicitude they show for their elderly. And of course, Basil's homilies abound with these kinds of moral lessons from the uh, animal world. Basil's brother, Gregory of Nyssa, offered not one, but two separate works to complete what Basil did not finish in his homilies. Gregory wrote on the making of the human person to cover day six, which Basil did not reach. And again, uh, Gregory's text was deeply informed by medical science. And then he also composed a shorter hexameron to fill in what Gregory saw as necessary philosophical and scientific undergirdings for Basil's presentation on the firmament and waters of the first three days. Gregory explained that his brother Basil had had to simplify on these matters because his audience included many, I quote, who were not up to subtle examination of his thought. Uncultivated men, artisans engaged in manual occupations, women folk untrained in such learning, a group of children and other people past their prime, end quote. I point out these are surely not unlike the people whose singing Jacob extolled in his homily on Palm Sunday I cited above. By contrast to all of this, Jacob's Mimro on the Hexameron, in his classic style, offered sumptuous poetry in simple meter, his characteristic 12 and 12 isosyllabic couplets. In his opening prayer, Jacob prayed that God should enable his homily, filling Jacob, the worthless servant, with fitting song, Zmirothok, to tell of creation and its formation, a story that must be sung, quote, with greatest beauty. Jacob chanted for poems, words, and songs belong to you, O Lord, as do beauties, glories, and adornments in their various form. And the term for glories here, shuphe, can also be translated songs of praise, of course. In content, Jacob's homily also differed from Basil's. Not only did he treat all six days of creation, but he included the seventh, the day when the Lord rested, in culmination to the astonishing glory of the six days work. Nor did Jacob seek to include natural history or philosophy, let alone allegory, in his exposition. It's not that these do not echo in the background, they certainly do, but they do not provide his method or his primary lens. Rather, I suggest that in this homily, Jacob sought to present creation as the template for liturgy, a presentation in which we are shown liturgy in its proper celebration, what, how, and why. I will first present an overview of this remarkable Mimro and then return to the matter of liturgical aesthetics in, in, at the end. So what is the story that Jacob tells for creation? In the homily on the six days, Jacob proceeds from the moment before the creation of heaven and earth. Jacob inserts a moment of prelude during which God created the ranks of heavenly hosts before undertaking creation as a whole. For this, he must draw not on Genesis, but on Psalms and the prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. In thrilling tone, Jacob recalls how rank upon rank, assembly upon assembly, God formed the angelic, cherubic, and seraphimic beings. Jacob names their orders. In this instance, echoing terms of Syriac liturgical orders, kenshe, congregations, kiome, minor orders, Mshamshane, deacons, mshaphane, choristers, and more. A glorious liturgy surged forth. And I'm going to quote a compressed, a compressed version of what Jacob sings for this. The Lord established them, he arranged them, he roused them to bless, to give praise, and to sing Alleluia. 
He filled their mouths with all shouts of praise and all shouts of joy, so that by nature they would sing glory at all times. Then from that moment, they began to produce all blessings and praises. Each one of them marveled at its being and was moved to give praise and never stop giving that praise. And the sound of their joy was thunderous and they all sang out a new hymn of glory with a loud voice. Creation, in fact, was one huge, unfolding, ever-increasing liturgical celebration. In this account, Jacob sings that God undertook creation, quote, because he found himself alone. God did not want to be the only being to know and delight in existence. Being, Ithutho, was a delight for God. Creation was a multiplicity of being that could share and experience and express that goodness, which was God's. Patiently, over six days, God created everything in its proper place and in its proper form of being. The six days were necessary, Jacob sang, so that creation could have an orderly arrangement, al tukoso, itself a liturgical term. Hence, everything was set properly in itself and in relation to everything else. All things were created as companions of one another, without confusion and in orderly array, each awaiting the next, each making place for the next. In this careful relationality, <clears throat> creation sounds not unlike poetry in its metrical patterns of distinct syllables and intersected rhythms. <clears throat> As God proceeded through his work, creation unfolded day by day in a series of wondrous processions, increasingly adorned with ever new sights, fragrances, sounds, colors, tastes, and textures. On the fourth day, the moon and stars came forth like ministers, shamoshe, with beautiful adornments, as though with candles, lanterns, and light lamps across the four regions of the earth. On the fifth day, sounding voices poured forth, first from the creatures of the sea, who suddenly filled what had been an empty space with great harmony, shinorabo and then the birds with glorious flight and song jacob marvels with no training without teachers without teachers he repeats it a sudden symphony jacob marveled of song color and every beautiful ornamentation i quote that creation which god created is a great mouth that recounts his glory nature cries out creation bears witness the change of seasons proclaims and then the animals came forth. And I quote again, noise increased. Bulls roaring, lambs bleeding, horses neighing, wild donkeys braying, dogs barking, deer leaping about, stags running around, lions roaring, bears growling, every species put forth sound to send forth glory. Note what Jacob does not do here. He does not make the animals moral exemplars in an anthropocentric view. He makes them themselves liturgical agents and thereby liturgical models. In its perfect harmony, Shino, its unison and harmony of song, creation displayed itself as a glorious house in the end. In fact, as a glorious wedding beer, awaiting the culminating wonder of creation in God's own image, Adam and Eve, equal in their beauty, Jacob tells us. Then brought to fulfillment, all creation stood there like bridesmaids with their songs and their chants, bringing their wedding gifts amid sweet breezes. And at last God rested, not because he was tired, but in order to delight 
in the beauty, the fullness, and the perfection. Hence Jacob sang rapturous praise for the beauty of number and time from one to seven, each with their own encomium, each more beautiful than its predecessor. When Jacob preached elsewhere, not in this homily, on the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he continued the theme of creation's song. When humanity disobeyed, Jacob chanted, I quote, their beauty was extinguished and their joyful sounds came to an end, end quote. The resounding song of heaven and earth that Jacob and Syriac poets lavishly accord the feast of the nativity was precisely the marking of creation beginning once again, restored and redeemed. And when Jacob imagined the second coming and the resurrection of the dead, he envisions cosmic acclamations that thunder beyond measure. Fittingly, Jacob ended his homily on the six days of creation with an extended meditation on the wonder of the seventh day, precisely as a liturgical procession. He called for every place, time, and portion to bring forth its ministry of praise. At its end, Jacob humbly offered himself utterly to the same. I quote, my frail mouth and all my senses that are so insufficient, all my limbs on both sides and my entire person my eyes, my ears, my feet, my hands, my tongue, my lips, my speech, even my voice, my brain, my mind, my heart, my kidneys, my soul and body, all their movements as well as my thoughts, along with all your creation, give to you, O Lord, praise and glory. So now, liturgical aesthetic. What then are the attributes of liturgical aesthetics if we take creation as the template for a properly celebrated liturgy? According to Jacob's Heximeron, these would be multitude of assembly, thunderous expression, variety of songs, sights, colors, fragrances, tastes, textures, plenitude, and fullness, abundance, and all of this in orderly arrangement. These are, of course, attributes of beauty in relation to the divine, as one would find them in Greek and Roman philosophical traditions and in other ancient Christian authors who treat creation as the expression of God's goodness. Above all, these attributes are richly embedded in scripture and fittingly for Jacob in the Psalms, which he often quotes. And like the Psalms, Jacob presents these attributes of God's creation specifically as attributes of liturgy. Creation for Jacob is more than metaphor or analogy. It is the type or model which, when applied over the ritual practices of liturgy, make its meaning and purpose clear concrete and profoundly consequential. In the interests of social history, I should note that there was a shadow side to at least some of these aesthetic attributes. The loudness Jacob so loves to extol was not simply a matter of acoustics before the existence of microphones. It was also a matter of being heard amidst the often abrasive competition and contestation between different religious groups. Late antique chronicles abound with descriptions of rival processions bitterly trying to outsing one another, whether Christians against pagans or Jews, or Nicenes against Arians or Manichaeans or Marcionites or Donatists. Much worship in late antiquity took place outdoors through town and city streets. Jacob, for example, urged that the dreaded songs of the theater be quashed by the glorious hymns of the church, or that the choirs of pagan girls should be silenced by the thundering voices of the church's women's choirs. His liturgies could not always present 
thunderous peace, although he lauded that. Then again, orderly arrangement, one of Jacob's most favored terms in the Hexameron, was an attribute that he often extolled in his festal homilies when naming all the ranks of the singing church, citing them according to age, gender, marital status, social class, and political status as free or enslaved. His lengthy lists of these different cohorts among the faithful, on the one hand ring with inclusive joy, all are welcome, let everyone sing. In his homily on the Lord's Prayer, Jacob chants that the same prayer, the Lord's Prayer, has been granted to all rich and poor alike. Everyone has debts to forgive, whether economic or moral, everyone can forgive. On the other hand, Jacob's insistence on such clear social ranks further inscribed rigid social categories of uneven political merit. Nonetheless, we should remember that Jacob's Hexameron presents creation in fact as the creation of Eden before the fall. Towards the end of his treatment of the sixth day, having described the formation of Adam and Eve with lavish delight, Jacob pauses his encomium. The Mimro, he sings, demands of him to include the fall of Satan in his account, even though Jacob did not want to bring that sad story into this Mimro. But prompted by the Mimro's impulse, Jacob briefly describes Satan's creation among the hosts of angels and his subsequent descent into envy and jealousy, where when he sees the greatest glory is Adam's. Thus the sixth day was the day of Satan's fall and the beginning of what would soon lead to what Jacob termed rebellion, corruption, destruction, and contention. Perhaps we might place the shadow side of Jacob's attributes among the results of the fall that would soon be Adam's and Eve's, and which would introduce division, disharmony, inequality, and injustice into God's perfect creation. In his homily on St. Ephraim, Jacob had remarked that yonder in the kingdom of God, men and women stand equal before the Lord. By that yonder, Jacob reminds his congregation that such is not the case here in our earthly realm. Yet Jacob would have it that we have a choice. In his homily on the prodigal son, he first extols the wonders of the natural world, its measures, time, spaces, and beings, all pouring forth manifold songs of praise. Then he prays, asking that he himself be granted capacity to chant fitting praise. <clears throat> For he notes, nature sings, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's been cold here this week. Jacob notes, nature sings because it was created to do so. I quote, free will have I alone of things created. It is not by choice that the sun is bright or the moon is fair. It is not free will of theirs that chooses to glorify you, O Lord. But for me, I who am free, praise is a virtue if I choose it. Wherefore, I shall glorify thee, my Lord, while trembling. In conclusion, I suggest that for Jacob, liturgy is that mode of being wherein creation, above or below and in every form of life, exists in its proper fullness. All are in orderly arrangement, in proper relation one to another, and each in relation to God. God's creation is one of abundant life. It surges with multitudes. Its plenitude shimmers, adorned, and radiant. Liturgy then, properly performed, is that state of being that most fully expresses creation in distinction and in relation with and for God. For Jacob, such liturgy is a ministry of song, harmonious, thunderous, loud, and glorious. And then 
It is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for your beautiful words. Um, your lecture is, if I may steal your phrase, a feast for the mind. Thank you for this wonderful and insightful lecture. It is time for questions to our participants on Zoom. I kindly ask you to raise your virtual hand. Then I may call you in the order I see on my screen. Uh, it looks like we have already two people. Um, Anthony. Yes, uh, I think this is unmuted now. Good thing. Uh, I want to begin this morning. Um, this is a morning full of praise and thanks. <laughs> and I want to, especially to you, Susan, but if you'll allow me just for a few things. First of all, uh, I want to thank our Bishop Elias for sponsoring this. It's already been done, but as a priest of the eparchy, it, this, this whole year has been just wonderful and enlightening. I want to also to congratulate Armando and Robert for the publication of their new book on Jacob Sarug. Uh, and um, again, to our bishop who sent us a copy, at least in our eparchy, as a Christmas gift. So, Sayedna, thank you. What a wonderful gift. I, um, I want to say this. My main work is with adult faith formation, trying to tailor it to our own tradition, the Syriac Maronite tradition. And I see it as a really real need to be fulfilled. And I'm really, this kind of work we've been doing is really helping in that, that way to help get this out to people, I think who, well, I'll just leave it at that because the, the, the need for adult faith formation is unquestioned. So uh, this, this helps so much. I want to turn to you now, uh, Susan, I really, I love your work. And in um, some of my recent work, I want to quote one article that you presented before. And it is about, um, well, the, the actual one is um, performance as exegesis women's liturgical choirs in Syriac tradition. And I found this an extremely wonderful and enlightening article for me. And in it, uh, you, I know that you concentrate on Ephraim's contributions, especially in promoting Orthodox doctrine sung in the liturgy. And you showed us that how important that was today, but in other articles too, you sh and today you showed how Jacob of Sarug uh, uh, furthered that as well, to show us how the faith was, was done and done effectively. And um, all I want to say at this moment is uh, thank you for that work. You. Just wonderful. And finally, to say what a lovely presentation you made this morning. So clear and inspiring. And thank God, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, other questions? I don't know if you saw this, Susan, but uh, there were comments in the chat. Uh, so beautiful. Thanks, Susan, such an inspiring presentation. I hope you can share this paper with us. And then it uh, says here from Alison, wonderful. Thank you, Susan. Sorry, I have to leave for a class now on Jacob of Odessa, Sixamaron. So here you go. Uh, Muriel? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for, for this wonderful talk. Um, it's uh, really um, um, for provoking on, on the question of um, aesthetics. Uh, as you mentioned, which is an aspect which is not often uh, taken into account. And I was wondering um, if you um, compared to what uh, John Chrysostomus says about the beauty of liturgy and the beauty of the house of God uh, during, um, during the liturgy, uh, the prayers in his um, uh, liturgy, uh, the liturgy attributed to John uh, Chrysostomus, about um, the, 
about the prayers for the beauty uh, of a liturgy uh, as a way of um, um, uh, giving praise. Because um, I, I'm not sure that the, um, the way is so much on uh, singing as it is in Jacob, but it might, I, I don't know if you had a look at that and, and, and if you could um, say something about uh, the, the comparison between uh, um, the Greek and, and, and Syriac tradition on that, on that ground. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and thank you for the references to John Chrysostom. Of course, um, I, I've had Basil and Gregory of Nyssa on my desk, partly because I've been teaching uh, Basil's Heximeron. Um, so I will go back again. I do think of Chrysostom talking often also, of course, Chrysostom is another wonderful source on liturgical behavior, both good and bad, and um, on, on the house and the home and the family as the small church, uh, as in analogy to the collected gathering of, of liturgy. So in those ways would be very parallel. I think the emphasis on beauty for liturgy is, is and certainly beauty of, cre of the natural world is a theme throughout Latin and Greek and Syriac writings, especially liturgical writings, um, in late antiquity. And in that, Jacob is not different from the others. He shares, you know, it's this resounding chorus across the Mediterranean. What I do find distinctive, I think, is his emphasis on song. And the fact that, and I think Chrysostom, but I may be remembering wrong, we have so much material evidence, as I, uh, cited briefly at the beginning about the stuff of liturgy, you know, the buildings, the decorations, what was in them, um, the accoutrements, the vestments, the instruments, the wall hangings, the tapestries, the frescoes. We, we have a lot of evidence about that and even references to those aspects of liturgical setting. But Jacob doesn't refer to any of that. He refers to singing over and over and over and over again. And so the closest that I think, well, I won't claim to have read all of Jacob, but the closest I could find to descriptions of material, the material aspects of worship in Jacob are in his descriptions of the created order, which I think, as I say, map onto each other. Um, but I will look again because Chrysostom, of course, is a wonderful source on these things. And perhaps he, I, I think this issue of are you referring to the external um, setting and its its display or not uh, is an, I think it's an interesting one. It's part of what I think makes Jacob applicable in villages as well as in cities. I mean, he certainly knew the glory of wealthy civic worship. But a lot of his preaching is in, I think, towns and, and countryside and village where you wouldn't have had all that stuff. And yet he presents the same kind of aesthetic. So that's what I'm trying to get at, but that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, George? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Susan. This is, this is really great. Uh, I have a question uh, uh, on the... Uh, liturgy interface, so to speak. Um, uh, evidently, uh, Jacob was used in liturgy and, and we see elements of in, uh, in all sorts of liturgy texts. Um, the challenge that one faces is the length of, uh, of, of these memory and how were they incorporated. Do you have any suggestions on how can one go about kind of studying the the workflow by which by which maybe the 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 members were incorporated into uh, uh, the liturgies partially fully? Uh, of course, we don't know much about how the liturgy looked like in his time, uh, as much as we know in the second millennium. Uh, and and any ideas on how one can can go about? To, to look into this. No, I think that's an incredibly interesting and important 
aspect of Jacob's legacy. And I remember back last January when Sebastian Brock preach, uh, preached, uh, delivered the first lecture in the series, I remember asking him about the length of, I was thinking of this particular, the homily on the hexameron, um, because it's so long. And Sebastian pointed to the fact that, of course, there was a tradition in late antique culture as there is still for many cultures of being able to listen to very, very long sermons or presentations or epic, you know, sometimes Jacob is like an epic poet. Um, I think I mean, John Chrysostom could preach for five hours at a time. Why couldn't Jacob? On the other hand, I, I, there is an aspect in Jacob's uh, homilies that is captured by the um, the particular editorial form that Bedian employs, which is that there are sections, you know, there are clear sections in his liturgy, in his in his mimre. Um, he does one thing for, you know, 20 or 40 or 60 lines, and then he does something else. I think it would be very easy to portion them out. I've sometimes wondered, um, I've sometimes wondered if, for example, in vigil services, you could present a memer of Jacob's, but intersplice it with litanies periodically or hymns to sort of wake people up. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's purely my own speculation, but I can see that the nature of his poetic construction is one that it could break into parts, into smaller units, and those might be transmitted for different aspects of the liturgy we had. Oh, in the wonderful, um, in the wonderful symposium you had a week or so ago in New Jersey on Jacob, I think um, Morseverios was presenting very uh, interestingly on the ways in which these pieces or portions of Jacob um, became uh, smaller units in later liturgical formation. So that's not. Uh, that's not something I've had a chance to look at, but it's it's something that would make great sense to me, and I think um, would account for the tremendous amount of Jacob that survives in later uh, liturgical collections, not just as entire homilies, but I mean, you know, portions and pieces. Thank you. I wish I could give you a better answer. Thank you, George. We can take one or more two questions. Okay, I would like to ask uh, Bishop. Ah, oh, we have a Jeff, 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 come back, Jeff. Okay. Um, he's he's here. Jeff Wicks. Jeff, you'd like you to ask to ask your question. Please unmute yourself. Here you go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks, Susan, for this talk so much. It was so helpful to hear and so, um, uh, frankly, edifying to listen to. So thank you. Um, I just had a simple question, um, thinking a little bit about the comparison to John Chrysostom. Um, Chrysostom seems so often interested in the domestic liturgy, the idea that the what you do uh, civically, you should replicate um, in the household. It seems to me that there's not that same kind of emphasis in Jacob that liturgy is, um, at least as he's interested in it, it's a civic activity. Um, you did mention the kind of ascetic becoming a kind of microcosm of the church, but my question is just, does, um, does Jacob, as, as far as you've seen, uh, show much of an interest in uh, the liturgy in the household, the domestic um, rituals? You know, that is an extremely interesting point, and I thank you for bringing that up, um, because that is a major theme in Chrysostom, what's going on at the fa in the family household, singing hymns at dinner, for example, is something every family should do together every night, and, and it, John really does um, cultivate that sense of liturgical practice at home in the family unit, whereas for Jacob, I think, certainly in what I've read so far, it really is about civic 
participation, the civic community, the whole community being together. Um, he does have these scenes of individual, individual prayer. Uh, and I think his scene of the Virgin Mary, an interesting thing about the Hexameron, um, of course, you know, one is very limited in time here and uh, Jacob always does many things at once, but a major theme in his homily on the Hexameron is marriage and the marriage between God and the earth, the God and the seas, and so that the sea will give birth to the creatures of the sea and then God and the earth so that the earth will give birth to many children and then Adam and Eve as a marriage that will be fruitful. And it's, it's very interesting in all these long 3020 lines, Jacob only twice stops to admonish his audience. And the, the second time is when he describes Adam and Eve as a marriage and he says, this is why you husbands and wives should be better to each other. You should be more faithful to each other because Adam and Eve were created for marriage and you are in marriage. So there's a lot about marriage in this creation homily that I find fascinating. Um, I, I think where families come in for Jacob is not, that's so interesting what you're bringing out. It's not the practice at home around the dinner table such as Chrysostom. Rather, it's the participation of the entire family in the liturgical procession. So in his festal homilies, he often says mothers and fathers, mothers carrying their babies, children coming with their parents, you know, he, elderly who are brought with their families. So he references often lovingly the presence of, of the intergenerations of the family, but as participants in, this, in, the, in the liturgy as a whole. So that is a very interesting difference, the civic context. I'll have to think about that, but that's, that's really something to, to ponder. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Susan. Uh, uh, one more question. More polycorpus? Yes. Thank you so much, Manfredo Susan, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, I have a question about the liturgy and its purpose. As you mentioned in Jacob's time, the liturgy consisted mostly of singing and hearing the word of God. And he mentions the word of God being as the streams of flowing water, saving water. Uh, one side of the question, can we find out what the liturgy consisted primarily during the time of Jacob from his memory? Secondly, you mentioned the functional purpose for teaching and learning. So then can we see the church as a school for the faithful would come to praise the Lord as well as to learn about their Bible and their faith? Thank you. Thank you very much, more Polycarpus. And also thank you for your splendid lecture on Jacob you gave last week for the New Jersey uh, Symposium. It was edifying for even those of us zooming in. Um, Jacob does speak of the liturgy as a school and also as a harbor of rest. I think the, the didactic language of education and edification is one of the predominant ones uh, and especially in something like his homily on the partaking of the mysteries. Now, I am not a liturgical scholar, which other people around the screen, including yourself, are. So I will be very careful in how I respond to this. Our early Syriac lectionaries, some of which are, are very early and of Jacob's time, perhaps, um, indicate many scripture readings. Uh, for the services that are listed in them, as many as 15 scripture readings. Although Jacob, in, in the homily on the partaking of the mysteries, Jacob refers to the readings of the Old and New Testaments so it, and the apostles. Um, it doesn't, it, he makes it sound like there were two or three scripture readings rather than 15. But, but we certainly have the, lection, the, the um, evidence of the lectionaries. However, over, and it seems to be, if I understand liturgical scholarship correctly, 
It is a feature of late antique liturgy in general, not only Syriac liturgy, but, but Greek and Latin as well, to use liturgy primarily pedagogically, educationally, to teach Bible in particular in, in, into a culture which hadn't had the Bible and its stories as a primary. I mean, how do you replace um, public art? How do you replace public cultural references which had been uh, all of pre-Christian shared stories and replace those with biblical knowledge, with biblical references, with biblical stories instead of um, stories of Homer or Greek tragedy or whatever. So there was a strong stress as far as we can, if I understand correctly, cross late antique liturgy for reading scripture, many scripture passages, and for teaching about it um, and using the liturgy to teach. And um, in Syriac liturgy, at least if, um, at least as I understand Jacob's homilies, that teaching took the form of, of, the, of the Mimre, but also of the, the hymns, the Madroshe. So it, it's something that went on it throughout the liturgy and um, singing was an important part of that. Now liturgy changes, of course, over, over centuries and the number of scriptural readings falls off um, later uh, so that there are fewer readings. And perhaps as centuries went by um, and one could presume the Christian community as one that was one of inheritance of traditions, you didn't need to instruct on Bible in the way that you needed to. With late antiquity, you're still dealing with many converts. You're still having to, to, to teach them that. Um, so the liturgy does change, changes a lot over time. But I, th Jacob really puts an emphasis on the importance of of learning at the liturgy and also using the liturgy to teach. And I think that is a very crucial part of why he emphasizes singing so much. I think this is a technique from the schools, melodic recitation and response. I think it's a technique he used in liturgy. Some of, uh, of the manuscripts for Mimre include responses that could be sung. Um, so I think certainly for Jacob, this is the primary work of liturgy. Perhaps it changes then at a later time, but for him, I think so. Thank you. I Thank you. That helps. Thank you. Thank you, Mor um, This brings this brings the end to our lecture. But we, before we adjourn, um, I'd like to invite uh, Bishop Zaiden uh, to say a word, please. Just at the end of this uh, series of lectures, I just want to say thank you for all the scholars from Sebastian to Susan and everyone else. Thank you for really giving us not just information, but way to uh, understand more uh, St. James of Seruja and also hopefully end as we were talking, Susan, about the liturgy to lift our hearts in prayer, all the creation, lifting uh, word of thanks and prayer to God for all his mighty deeds. I want to thank Father Armando for uh, coming up with this idea and, and all his work and all his effort. Thank you, Robert, for your great assistance as well, and both of you, and for all the scholars you picked. Thank you. God bless you. And uh, uh, a thousand thanks for every one of you. God bless all your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Bishop Zaiden. Appreciate your wonderful words. Uh, Robert? Muted. Robert, you're muted. There we go. Okay, so the, the idea of uh, one lecture a month did initially to us did not seem hard. Uh, <laughs> Sebastian and Susan agreed and were gracious to accept right away. And, and the other 10, it took us only a matter of about a week and now it's December, but on the way to December, I think we can say that we, we found uh, a number of things that we did not anticipate it, but, but we certainly appreciated deeply. Uh, there were lectures and many others who participated in our hour long sections from 
around the Syriac studies world, which is virtually now worldwide. We had people from Hong Kong uh, listen, South Korea, India, the Near East, all over Europe, all over North America. Uh, there were graduate students, professors, independent scholars, some people from other disciplines, uh, and many who would not have, many of them, I think we can say, would not have been able to make the trip to spend the money to take time off of our, um, uh, you know, to come to a traditional in-person conference. So I think while we look forward to the day when COVID-19 will no longer constrict us, I think in some fashion we should not dispense with the benefits that Zoom has allowed us. A second thing, I think, which we all are perhaps aware of now as a benefit, a sense of the gracious community in the field of Syriac studies has, uh, it's not been invented, it's renewed itself. Uh, we shared accomplishments, the sadness of deaths of some of our colleagues, new books. We do want to meet one another again and even talk with one another about perhaps even non-Syriac topics. But there is value and virtue in, I think, in some fashion in doing both in-person conferences and an occasional Zoom. So thanks to Armando and to all of the participants who have helped us uh, in in creating this year of Jacob of Suru. Thank you, Robert, for your word. Appreciate it very much. Um, the insights of Jacob of Serug into the mystery of salvation and his Christocentric theology transcend time and space. Those who heard his biblical interpretations 1,500 years ago found value in them and preserve them for future generations. One generation handed them to another until, until these interpretations reached us, albeit some of them. Jacob impacted Middle Eastern men and women in the area where he served, and he's still influencing us worldwide today. We come from various backgrounds and belong to different Christian communities. Some of us might not, might not even be Christians. But Jacob's theological and exegetical acumen brought us together as one community to honor him throughout 2021. Jacob's thoughts are so intricate that they require a community of scholars to unpack and clarify them to us. And what a lineup of scholars the year of Jacob of Saruk had. In the name of Bishop Zaidan, the sponsor of this online conference, Robert and I, Thank all of you for making the year of Jacob of Sarug successful. We particularly thank the esteemed speakers, Sebastian Brock, Philip Fornes, Jeffrey Wicks, Muriel Dubier, Manolis Papoutsakis, Aaron Galgay Walsh, Roger Achras, Kelly Bryan Gibson, Aaron Butts, Thomas Kolamparampil, Khalil Alwan, last but not least, Susan Ashbrook Harvey. On a personal note, I would like to thank Robert for organizing this online series of talks. His support and encouragement, I appreciate very much. The fruit of this conference has been the videos posted online, but a volume to commemorate in print the 15th hundred anniversary of the death of Jacob of Serug will complement will complement well the digital medium. Bishop Zaidan, thank you for sponsoring this, this uh, lecture of series. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, and be on the lookout for another conference. Look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>